Welcome in to the last edition of This Week in UNC Baseball with head coach Scott Forbes. I am Tommy Ashley. Matt Clements is on the IL today, or rather, he has pet issues. Uh, I can certainly understand pet issues. So it's just Coach Forbes and myself. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and johnnytshirt.com. Coach, it's been, I guess, 11 days since the season ended in Terre Haute to, in the extra inning loss to Iowa. Just first question, I really felt like that game basically summed up your season to a T. Extra inning loss, opportunities to win, timely hitting didn't come through, and then they make a play. Just looking back to that day, um, what were those emotions? What were those thoughts and feelings as that one wound up? Man, just, you know, your goal as a coach should be to help your players reach their ultimate goal, and our ultimate goal is to get to Omaha and have a chance to win a national championship. So, Personally, for me, you know, I feel like, you know, I let these guys down. We didn't get it done um, because this was a great group that did everything right. We had some adversity, but every team has adversity. Uh, but we had more injuries than we've had here in a long time. And we were still in a position to win, you know, watching our guys and watching how they competed. You know, you had that sadness, but you also have that proud factor if you feel good about the way your guys go about their business, but you're – you know, the upset and your competitive side is you, obviously you're not happy that you didn't come out on top. And I thought we could win that regional. thought our pitching got better and better as the season went along. Um, and like you said, you know, Mac gets that home run. The game's tied. We have some opportunities. Uh, Mac almost catches an unbelievable ball in, in center field, just misses it. And baseball is a game of inches. You know, I look at all of our, our years. and um, But you're right. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it sums it up, but it's just – Instead of finding a way to win those games, you know, we just lost them by a hair, whether or not it's a big hit or a big pitch. And if you reverse that and win more of those one-run games, you know, you, you're going to have more wins. Uh, but the emotions were tough because, you know, there's some guys on that team that you're never going to coach again. Um, and you're just going to – you know, personally, I'm just going to miss being around them every day. Yeah, how do you – as a coach, uh, and, and I get that fans watch and we all watch and, and don't understand the relationships that are involved in especially college athletics um, where you see these guys come in. We'll talk about Horvath, for example. He comes in. He's a kid. Uh, young kid comes in, and you watch him grow. You talked about that a lot during the season. And then when it's over, and he was emotional after that game, um, as a coach, almost as a father figure, just sort of describe how do you deal with that, for lack yeah. of a better way to put it. You know, I've never seen Mac Horvath really emotional. Um, he's a pretty dry kid, pretty even keel. So that was tough. You know, I look at these kids like they're my own. Um, you know, I have kids, and <clears throat> I know how I would want them coached. I know how, how I would want them treated. And – we take a lot of pride in that here as a staff, you know, making sure these guys know that we care about them, that we love them, that we care about their lives first. Obviously, we want to be great baseball players. And I know Mac felt that. I felt that. And uh, when you have that realization, <clears throat> excuse me, as a player, that that might be your last game at a place you absolutely love where you poured everything you have into it, that's difficult. Um, I know Mac's not a senior, but realistically, you know, he knew in his mind that that's probably his last game. He's got a chance to be a really high draft pick. And uh, I can just go back to when I played. You know, I played for Coach Fox. I remember my last game in the Division Three World Series. Um, I remember being knocked out, and the re reality hits you like, man, like – because that's all Mac's done, right? He's come down to the stadium every day. He's gone to school. He's represented us well. And – uh it's a neat thing because you realize the type of kids you have and you realize how, how bad they want us to be successful. And that's why it, I think it hurt the most for Matt because he wanted to lead this team to a title and he gave it everything he had. And when you do that, you know, it's, it's emotional. Yeah. And baseball is a game of failure, like we talked yeah. about and seeing guys have to deal with it, especially, you know, that last game, that last out, it's like a ton of bricks hitting the floor. <laughs> So, so how do you deal with that as a coach and as a staff, seeing guys leave, knowing that the transfer portal is a thing? I mean, it's been churning <laughs> in Chapel Hill. I mean, how do you sort of compartmentalize, okay, I'm sorry to see you go, but I got to look up here. 
you know you know what i mean because yeah. it's so rapidly coming at you at the end of the season you know i think the more you coach the more you you should get better as a coach of of understanding that okay your top priority are your players your current players right then and there obviously your next team's important too and you, and in your mind, you have to say, okay, we got to get ready for the 23, 24 season, but we're flying back. You know, um, you want to, you want to spend more time with those guys. You know, you want to have those exit meetings. You want to have those individual meetings with like the Will Sandys and Nick Prize, the Max Reamers, the guys, you know, that are never going to play here again. Um, I've started a tradition of those guys um, coming over to the house, Manny and I feed them, you know, a good steak dinner. <clears throat> and then we just, have a good time and talk. And then I meet with those guys individually one-on-one -on -one and ask them about their experience. You know, what do they feel like we can do better as coaches? How can we can improve our program? Things like that. And then the reality is you got to move on to the next season and you have to have every one of those exit meetings with every player that was here, all 30 guys that were on the postseason roster. You, you, you got to have those meetings and then you have to turn your full attention to the next team. And that's just reality, right? Like, I mean, that's how fast it happens. And uh, you got to recruit, you got to transfer portal. I mean, there are over 5,000 names on the transfer portal, uh, which is crazy to me. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is. And now you got NIL. So there's a lot of things to manage. But, uh, you know, the one thing about North Carolina that I'm proud of is, is our guys know what it's truly about here. Um, and the, and they, they all believe that the winning will, will follow that if you do it the right way. When you evaluate your roster, you're having those exit meetings. Um, you have guys leave. How, how does that work when you have a guy like, you know, Austin Hall, Eric Grants, they're in the portal. Um, they, they had some success at North Carolina but didn't play. And guys want to play. I understand that. Um, how do you sort of manage those? Hubert obviously had those talks last year and cleaned out the basketball team. Mac talks about it every time. How does a baseball coach deal with that? Um, given that you got limited scholarships, you got uh, positions you got to fill, and you got guys that want to play, those off-season discussions with those type situations. Yeah, I'm you know I'm a big time believer in honesty. Um, you may not not believe you may not agree with what I'm telling you, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I see in that individual meeting. I'm going to tell you exactly where I think you are. I'm going to tell you exactly where I think you need to improve, but I'm even going to go farther and I'm going to tell you who's coming in here and what position they play. And, you know, it might be harder than it was this year. You know, we might have more depth because for me, when it comes to that, you know, I get the playing time part and, and, First of all, any kid that ever leaves North Carolina, you know, to, to get on the transfer pool and play somewhere else, I'm going to support them. You know, I'm going to try to help them. Um, but on the reverse side of that, this is North Carolina. And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that you got to be in from the top to the bottom. And, you know, you look at a guy like Angel Zarate, didn't play two years, and he gets on the field. Mikey Madeda doesn't play. So there's, there's a lot of good stories here, and, and I know what those stories are about. Now, we didn't have the transfer portal, so that changes it a little bit. Um, but every, every kid is a different case. You know, like you look at an Eric Grants, he's a fifth year guy. He's graduated. Um, he really wants to play a year with his brother. Um, man, Eric Grants is, I want him to do whatever he wants to do. Right. You know, and, and, uh, you know, his brother can't, is not going to play here. So to be able to do that, Grants, he's going to have to go play somewhere. So you obviously want to help him do that. You want to call coaches and, you know, you, you mentioned Austin Hawk, you know, Anytime a kid decides that that's what they want to do, I'm going to wish them well, and and then you just move right along. That's that's the way it works these days. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can't dwell on them, that's for sure, because a lot of other fan bases have dwelled on people that have left, and it just does no good to do that. None. So, so, so let's talk about how the draft affects things, because we talked a little bit off air, and you've got some strong opinions on that, which I agree with you. You, you mentioned Horvath. He's, I mean, he's gone. If he's as high as they say he's going to be or higher, he's got to go. Um, how do you do that as far as a coach? If, say, somebody like Tomas Frick gets drafted in, in a position where it's either or, how are those discussions? Are there any discussions there? I know Dean Smith used to say, you got to go, son. And I remember yep. Phil Ford famously said, who's going to tell my mama? And uh, so <laughs> yeah. how does that work on the baseball side? 
Yeah, you know, it's funny you said that because I believe in the same thing. You know, I'm a huge Dean Smith fan, obviously Roy Williams as well. I believe that I have to do my job, and my job is the kid first. Even over, you know, certain things, you know, if it's an injury or if it's their life, I have to say, okay, what's best for Matt Corbett? What's best for Tomas Frick? Um, and we do have those meetings. We, we talk about it. Hey, do you want to sign? Will you sign if you're drafted here? Um, do you want to sign no matter what? Because there's a big difference, right? You know, will you sign for $25,000 or do you want to try to put a little bit of money away? Um, you know, you're not going to – if you're not a high pick, the money you're not going to get much money anyway. Um, but you have to have those very candid conversations, not just with our returners, but you have to have them with your incoming guys because the draft is later. The draft now is in the middle of July. The draft used to be over. It was at Super Regional. Now they moved it. It's been brutal for college. Like, it's, it makes no sense. But it is what it is. So if you wait and you try to replace that kid with a kid off the portal that you like a, a lot, he's going to commit somewhere else. So it's a tough balancing act for all of us. That's why the numbers are higher. Now, Tommy, the COVID year is about to go away. Yep. So I think that's going to shrink it some. You won't have as near as many grads. You just have straight up transfers that get on and they're going to have two or three years or one year left in their career. And you also have guys that entered the portal that are juniors that want to sign pro and they want a backup plan. They want to commit somewhere or they might want to commit somewhere to help their draft stock. You know, I'm going to North Carolina, I'm going to Vanderbilt. And if you don't give me more money and, you know, you see, so you got to really filter through it. But for our current guys, I just believe in having honest conversations. Uh, we talk through it, and I tell them, hey, first of all, if you want to sign professionally, you've given us everything you've had. I'm going to support it. I'm not going to get upset at you. I'm not going to tell you you're an idiot. That's your ultimate dream. Every kid that comes to North Carolina to play baseball, their ultimate dream is to play for the Braves, the Yankees, the Dodgers. I want to help them reach that. But I also want to help them understand the value of leaving here, at least with three years towards your degree. And in some cases, it's better to come back. Um, because if you leave with your degree, like a Jacob Stallings did, like an Adam Warren did, and but let's say they didn't make it and you're 28 years old and you get released, you don't have to spend that year, that year and a half figuring out, okay, I got to get an apartment. I got to go back to school. I got to register for my classes. So I, I, I'm just honest with them. I'm like, Hey, I don't think you should sign if you're a 15th rounder, but if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. you need to know that I'm going to give you a big old hug and I'm going to wish you well, because you've, You've given us everything you've had. So that's like a Tomas Frick. You know, depending on where he goes, that's up to Tomas. He loves it here. I could see him coming back here. I could see him signing pro. And whatever that kid wants to do, I'm going to support him because that kid gave us every ounce of effort and energy that he had for three years. Indeed he did. How does NIL play in all this now? I mean, it's it, it's the basketball team looks different because of NIL. The football team – is affected by NIL. How is how is your team, college baseball, being affected by NIL? You mentioned the COVID year, which is trashed rosters all across yeah. everywhere. Um, but NIL is a thing, and it's a baseball thing now. How how is that coming around in Chapel Hill? Well, baseball is booming. You see it. Um, you know, we're in the Olympic sport, but we're not Olympic sport. Let's just be honest. Like it's you know you. It is what it is. And, and NIL got in way quicker than I thought it was going to. And UNC baseball, you know, our school doesn't have a school-wide collective, as you know. Mm -hmm. and some schools do. And if you have that school-wide collective, everybody's getting usually a piece of that, that thing. But if your school doesn't have a school-wide collective, how are you going to get a collective? How are you going to help? How are you going to figure out this NIL? Um, and thankfully, we've had the support where we're, we feel like, okay, we – our players will benefit, we hope, through NIL opportunities. Um, but we continue to have to have help and get people to donate to that that those opportunities. But it's, you know, it's 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 the, it's it's happening. You know, there's not a recruit at North Carolina that I don't talk to that is telling me that they're getting a whole lot of something. You know, I know it's not, I, you know, we're not allowed to tell a kid you're going to get this much money from NIL, but somehow, shape or form, they're getting contacted and they're, and they're getting money. So it's real and uh, we're trying to navigate those waters. But again, you know, your standards and your culture, they are, they are, and I'm not going to bend them. So we've got it in North Carolina, even though we're going to have NIL, we want to do it right. We want to be, be, it be done the right way. You know, everything checks the boxes with compliance. Um, 
but I, it's, it's, it's interesting to say the least. I never thought I would see it like this, but it is what it is. And for us to compete at the highest level, uh, we've got to be able to, to be in that game. Yeah. And quite frankly, it goes to the fan base. I mean, fans want to say, why didn't you get so-and-so? Well, so-and-so got a lot somewhere else. Make it make it on the level playing field. It's a fascinating discussion. Let's talk about summer placement. Yeah, I wish I had my NIL stuff. I pull, hold the barcode, and everybody that's, that's watching this thing can <laughs> donate to the UNC baseball NIL. <laughs> that is a – I mean, it's a thing. Every coach at every university mentions that now, and that's, that's what's kind of crazy for me because I'm an old-school guy. You know, go to school, get education and all that, and go play on the pros. Now it's – I've heard about local recruits that are sophomores and juniors in high school that are already talking about it and getting it or say they're getting it, which is nuts. It's uh, nuts. And I'm hoping that North Carolina, you know, baseball is unique because there's only 11.7 scholarships. And my goal from the from the get-go, and you have to be careful what you say because you want to be compliant, but my goal is to help our players as much as possible. And I hope in time, even when I'm gone, if I've worked my tail off, help raise enough money where every player that ever plays baseball at UNC can leave debt free. Because we've had a lot of players play here that have come as walk-ons, you know, that have come with very little baseball scholarships, that are taking out loans, they're doing this, they're doing that. So the pay the pay for, you know, paying players in football and basketball, maybe some of these SEC baseball schools, it's going to be hard to happen at UNC baseball. But we can Just didn't use if we can do things the right way, and raise the, the amount of money. And uh, I hope that our guys can benefit from it and their families can. So they, when they do leave with that degree, they're not consolidating loans and, and having to pay back. That's my hope for what it's how would How would changing the scholarship narrative in college baseball? There's been discussions about making giving more. How would that – what's your opinion on that? I mean, obviously you like to have 30 happen. scholarship. You don't yeah, think I don't it'll, think it'll happen. happen? Because then you got to raise that same money. The same people that are giving money to help football and basketball, you know, where do you want them to give their money? That's the question now with NIL. So I don't see us increasing our scholarships maybe one day. Um, you know, I mean, it's crazy we don't have 11.7 if you really think about it. Uh, to go along with this year, we can carry 40. Um, it'll be the last year, then it'll go back to 35. But, you know, that's where if the schools have uh, – and their, their players are benefiting from NIL and they're getting a 50% baseball scholarship, but they're also doing something through an NIL and making that other 50%, well, their school's paid for. And uh, that's that's what we're up against recruiting right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't think folks fully understand the puzzle you have to put together um, to compete. I mean, just to compete, not, not talking about win yet, just to compete. Um, summer, summer assignments, sort of – what do you want for guys? Like, how, do, how does that work at Carolina? Um, you got guys going to the Cape. You got guys playing locally. Um, as a coach, what do you want to see your players do? You got some staying home and, and getting healthy and working out there. What's your ideal um, wish list or ask for your players during the summer? Yeah, every, every player, again, is individualized. Um, Certain players need to go play for sure. They need at bats. Um, that's how you get better. I talked about Angel Zarate earlier, went to High Springs, hadn't played much here, played all summer, 200 plus at bats, came back a much better player. So that's number one. If you haven't played a lot, uh, you got to get out and you got to play. And that's a great thing about summer ball, either as a pitcher or a position player. Get those at bats as a position player, you're better defensively. You got to have some discipline so you continue to add strength. Same thing on the mound. And then you got some guys, you know, like a Poston. Or Nap, who had a, a heavy workload, uh, you shut them down. You get them with Coach Gats. You encourage them. Hey, we'd love for you to stay here. They work our camps. They get to know our summer school incoming guys. They help, you know, continue to help those guys understand what it's like here, what our culture is like, what our standards are like. Um, so everyone's unique. You know, you got like a Hunter Stokely. Um, you know, hey, let's try to get as big and strong as you can, and you know, take another step this year to doubling your RBI total by hitting more doubles and hitting more home runs and becoming more of a complete player. So I really, the, the whole goal is that every player, whatever they're, we're doing with them is they come back better. Um, and sometimes if it's a three-year player, rest is the best thing. If it's an injured player, rest is the best thing. And if it's an arm that's thrown a lot, rest is the best thing. But those position players that haven't played a lot, those pitchers whose, whose innings weren't high, they need to go pitch and they need to pitch a ton. 
couple more questions. We're talking to head coach Scott Forbes, North Carolina Diamond Hills, sort of a season wrap-up show here. Coach Forbes, uh, leadership is huge. We've talked about uh, probably the biggest leader in North Carolina the last couple of years it will be departing, most likely departing. So who's in that role and how does that role shift in the offseason into 23-24 um, when you lose a guy like Horvath, who, who has been a lead by example, Frick's more vocal, um, but who, who steps up next year that North Carolina fans maybe wouldn't think about or might expect to? Yeah, you know, with performance, too, comes leadership, right? Like, you know, you got the guys that may not be playing every day that are, are great leaders because of what they do. But, you know, if you're an everyday player or you're one of our main pitchers, like that's a responsibility. You either accept it and you grab it and you run with it or you don't. And I feel like we've got some guys that are going to grab it and run with it and do a good job of it. Obviously, Vance Honeycutt, um, you know, I think he's learned a lot from Mac. I think he's becoming more of a vocal leader. He's 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 arguably our best – player, our most talented player. And then we're lucky. We returned two fifth years and Alberto Osuna, who's coming back for his fifth year, Patrick Alvarez, just older guys that know how to do things around here. Um, and you got some older guys like Stokely, the guys that have been through it, uh, that know what we're going to be doing every single day. But Vance obviously steps out because, you know, he's one of the best players in the country. Um, except for his injury, he, he, he played every single inning. Yeah, he, I asked him if I'd ever taken him out of a game, and he said one game at Virginia when he was over four or four strikeouts, but I didn't even remember that. And then we've got a core group of pitchers this year, too, that are really taking the next step in posting, in nap, and in some of these older guys that like, okay, they could they weren't really gonna lead much because they hadn't pitched here, and but now I can already see it in them the way Knapp carries himself, the way Poston carries himself, the way Peterson carries himself, Dalton Pence carries himself. So I'm excited about that. I think uh, you know, instead of having like one, I think we've got a chance to have a collective group of really good leaders. It'd be interesting to see how it shakes out. Let me ask you a personal question. How how do you eval evaluate yourself and your coaching staff after a season? Um, like you just had. Um, everybody looks in the mirror. How does Scott Forbes look in the mirror and then look at his his coaches, assistant coaches, and and sort of do that exit interview slash evaluation? I mean, you do it as direct and as bluntly as it needs to be done. We're all really close coaching staff. But at the end of the day, it starts with me. So I'm going to look myself in the mirror for number one. That's what – if you're a leader – you know, your ego's got to be put aside and you have to say, okay, where the buck starts here. The whole program, pitching, hitting, defense, academics, culture, you name it. Um, and I think that's important. You know, you're always, if you're not trying to grow and you're not trying to learn, you're not trying to get better, it's time to retire and do something else, in my opinion. Uh, so I enjoy that. I enjoy looking at myself in the mirror and say, okay, let's look back. How could have I done this better? Um, can I go somewhere, you know, can I talk to somebody that's a little bit older and get their opinion on how to do this better, that better? And then, again, sitting down with each coach one-on-one, -on -one, um, I have our coaches evaluate themselves, talk to me first about how they think they can do better, some things that we need to improve on as a staff, and then I tell them, okay, here's what I've been seeing. Um, you've really grown in these areas, and we want to we want to be, get better in these areas. Uh, and we're lucky, you know, we always talk about it around here, there are no there are no egos in this room with me, Coach Gaines, Coach Howell, Coach Where's Bicky, you got Carter Hicks, you got Daniel Wilkerson, you know, Jones, our secretary, Dave Arenas, Terry Joe, our trainer. All we want is our players to be successful and for us to win as many games as possible. And then how do we do that? And sometimes tough conversations help you do that. But honest, tough conversations and saying, hey, you got to be better at this. And here's how we're going to do it. That's kind of how we go about it. Yeah, last question or last couple questions, and I appreciate you taking time. I know you're crazy busy. How oh, yeah, you, absolutely. How do you decide if it was a coaching issue or the players just sit and step up? You know what I mean? Because everybody wants to say if somebody doesn't get a bunt down, well, why aren't they teaching them how to bunt? You know what I mean? How do, yeah. how do you blend that when you're doing these evaluations um, with your coaching staff, with your players? That, where's the line there? Coach needs to coach better. Player yeah. needs to do it. Yeah, you know, I've always believed in the motto that 
the players win the games and the coaches lose the games. And that's not always true necessarily, but I think that's how a coach should think. Um, and that's how I look at it. I look at it like, okay, it starts with us. We've got to prepare them better. Did we prepare them enough? And, and you know, obviously players have to perform, but part of coaching is also trying to put them in a, in a, in a situation where they can get that confidence and perform. Um, the most frustrating part of coaching is when you do, you know, we take a lot of pride on fundamentals, on defense, like you said, on bunting, and you do those things every day. You repeat them every single day, and then for some reason, they don't get it down, right? Um, but when you prepare, and you know as a coach that you have your guys prepared, it's a good feeling in the back of your mind, then you got to let them play. And unfortunately, sometimes – in baseball, like you said, a kid hits a rut at the wrong time. Um, you know, we don't have enough guys hitting collectively at the right time. Or, you know, you, you I remember all those years as a pitching coach thinking, man, that, that was the best bullpen he's had in a, in a long time. And he goes out on Friday night and he just stinks. Uh, but that's, that's coaching. And then, okay, well, let's go back and see how we can even do better next time. Um, but I just believe that. I believe these coaches that, that play the blame game, I believe that's a bunch of baloney. Uh, we're the coaches. They're the players. We've got to prepare them. And you have to do all you can to simulate the game, but that's the hardest part of coaching. When the real game starts, you know, the players that can learn to control that heartbeat, that can handle the bright lights and handle the, the, the Florida States, the Miamis, that's a lot different than a scrimmage. And then you got to kind of figure out which ones are best at that. Biggest regret decision from 2023 season for you? Ooh. And I'll Man, ask the flip I, question too on the other no, side. No, I would say, honestly, if it for me, I talked to Coach Gaines about this. When Dalton Pence gave up those runs at ECU early, um, we should have. I should have as the head coach, not we. I should. I, I know what Dalton Pence is. I know how tough he is. I know how hard he works. I should just right away roll him back out there, roll him back out there, roll him back out there because you see how good he was, mm -hmm. especially down the stretch. Well, I think it took too long to get over and reminding myself, like, Dalton Pence had never been in that situation. He's never been in that situation in East Carolina. And I should have stepped back and been like, okay, he's never been in that situation. He's going to get better at it. So we got to keep putting him in that situation. And now, you know, if he's in it like five more times and he fails, all right, get him out. But, you know, like I look back at that game against East Carolina at home early, I think maybe just manipulating the staff a little bit earlier because I felt like later we had them figured out for the most part and we knew who needed to do what. Um, I just think that's so important from the pitching side of things. Favorite moment of the season? Oh, man. You got to give me specifics. Or okay. I'm Favorite moment was Colby Wilkerson getting that suicide squeeze down on that Friday, Thursday against NC State to win the game. Because we've been getting down the whole time. And Eric Grant's too. Like, I mean, Eric Grant's phenomenal kid, didn't play every day, always ready, led by example. Um, getting that big hit, getting that triple, pitch running. And then Colby, like you talk about, stuff we practice all the time that we have not done. We practice suicide squeeze every day. Every day, I'm like, guys, we got we got to win a game with this, and then to win it against NC State, to get the momentum, and then sweep NC State, um, knowing that we had to suspend 26 players over the span of six games and still get that sweep and give us a good chance going into the into the remainder of the season to make the postseason. That was probably one of the biggest highlights for me. Yeah, down five nothing in that game. Exactly, and you know, it was NC State, and uh, makes a little bit of a difference. Makes a little bit of a difference, no <laughs> doubt about it. That is head coach Scott Forbes. Coach, I appreciate you joining. I'll be around in the fall, too. We're going, we're going to continue to do this if you'll allow it. Um, but it's always been a pleasure. Oh, yeah, Sorry absolutely. Blue. Yeah, Sorry I'd like to do it in the fall and get more attention. We had a ton of – I do want to take the time to thank the fans. I mean, we had unbelievable crowds. Um, you know, we, we obviously, for us, you know, I get congratulations. Uh, you know, congratulations in my mind. I'm like, congratulations on what, you know, we made the postseason. You know, when you're competitive by nature, you're not going to be happy at North Carolina unless you're in Omaha. So, but the fans were phenomenal. Our crowds were phenomenal. They were in every pitch. And man, that was cool to see. I mean, we sold a ton of tickets. 
Um, I feel great about next year's team. I'm excited about next year's team. Uh, I'm excited about the fall. You know, I'm working on it today, actually, trying to map it out, and I'll get that to you. And I want to get the fans out for that as well. we'll you know, we're going to play a couple teams here uh, during the fall. But um, I did want to take that opportunity because we had really good fan attendance, and uh, that's that's important for our team. Yeah, well, speaking of the Bosch and all, anything you'd like to see differently in Bosch as far as – game day, um, facilities, obviously facilities are always a thing, but anything that we can expect to see differently in the fall that maybe you learned from this season with the fan base, with, with all that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I thought our, I thought our operations did a great job. Obviously we want to do all we can to keep the fans engaged and and create a home field advantage. Um, you know, that's number one that we talk about when the season's done with all of our folks here, like when's the right time to play the music, when's the right time to make sure they're on their feet, things like that. Um, facility wise, we feel great about our facility. It looks great. Um, you know, we upgraded our weight room. We've got an unbelievable dining facility under the player amenities are, are really good, but we're one of the, we're one of the few teams in the country that has had the success we've had that doesn't have a, a pitching specific uh, they call people call them pitching labs. Uh, you know, I want to build a pitching developmental center. So I'm working hard to raise that money. I'm working hard to figure out how to do it, you know, uh, as soon as possible. Um, matter of fact, I want to try to take one of the, one of the cages and go ahead and make a, a pitching facility in there until we can build it down here on the left field line. But that's the next step for us. Um, you know, and, and other than that, everything looks great. We got to put in the pitch clocks this year, uh, redo the pads, some little things. Um, Man, it's a nice place, and it's a great setting to watch a game. But for me, it's all about our players and their development. Indeed. Anything left, anything we did not cover in the 23 season that that you want to get out there? The fan base, I agree. The, the fans in the Bosch, especially when it warmed up, it was a, it was a, good, a good deal out there. Um, still got to figure out how to get the Modelo sponsorship active on this show <laughs> yeah i can't i can't speak to that but i i can tell you that uh you know our, our fans should be proud of our kids too they represent us well off the field they had a great year academically our guys are graduating um you know we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get these guys to omaha but again um at a school like north carolina when you have so many sports um you have to raise money um to be able to operate at the level you want to operate at and that's a a top national program, which we are. Um, you know, I saw a stat the other day. I think us and Virginia have been to Omaha the most times in the last, maybe Stanford's in there now, maybe Texas or whatever, in the last 15, 20 years. And that's hard to do. Um, you know, we, we made the postseason again. It's hard to do I mean, now more than ever. I mean, you look at some of these teams that didn't make it even into the – and then you look at these teams that went two and out, you know, you, or, or just lost their national seeds, Vanderbilt, Arkansas, Clemson. Um, but at North Carolina – we have to raise money. So I do encourage fans, you know, if you want to be generous, you can give to the Diamond Hills. And now we're going to have an avenue where you can help our student athletes through NIL. That'll be out there pretty soon. Um, and that's part of my job, right? To go out there and do that. Um, you know, and asking people to, to, to give is not easy, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. So that's the, that's the thing that we're trying to keep improving on and supplementing our budget the best we can. Indeed, Coach Forbes has been this week in UNC baseball. Season wrap. Shout out to Johnny T-shirt for sponsoring. Shout out for Matt Clements. Hope the animals get well. Yeah, we Coach know Forbes. Matt. We know Matt's probably. He, he, that, he, that's not true. He's probably got his feet in the sand somewhere looking at the ocean. <laughs> I will let him know. I know he'll be watching this very shortly. But <laughs> shout out to you for joining us all and Jody for putting them together. We we shall talk soon. I'm not. Right. Uh, Thank you. We're not going to disappear. We'll be back in the fall for sure. Yeah, and I'll be seeing you a lot over at football. I'm a big, big football. I'm a big everything fan at North Carolina. So hopefully our fall sports will do awesome. Yep, indeed. Take care, Coach, and we'll Thanks, talk Tommy. soon. All right, buddy. Thanks. Take care.